Today we're going to pick it up in verse 23, and we'll finish the chapter today. And before we dive into the details of it, I want to just give you a brief flyover of, of the kind of three movements as I see it of this final section of chapter 2. First, verses 23 through the first part of verse 24, Paul gives negative commands. Negative commands. Essentially, for you to avoid being a dishonorable liability. A dishonorable liability. We, we've just finished with Paul in, in the previous section of this, this chapter talking about vessels for honor, for an honorable use, and those for dishonor, dishonorable use. On the heels of that, Paul gives negative commands with a view towards our being honorable, honorable, excuse me, vessels. But then after that, in the second half of verse 24, through the first half of verse 25, Paul gives positive commands. So he gives negative commands, don't do this, don't be like that, but then he gives positive commands with a view towards our becoming more like Jesus, that we might lean into the holy calling we've been given in Christ to be honorable vessels for good use in the household of God. So he gives negative commands, then he gives positive commands, and then he gets underneath all of that to the motivation behind these commands. Verses 25 through 26 demonstrate the, the motivation in us not doing certain things and engaging positively in other things. The motivation is the repentance and salvation of those who have been captured by the enemy, who, who, who are slaves of sin and death in the kingdom of darkness. We're, we're, we're to be set to good use as honorable vessels, not dishonorable. So, so we're not gonna do certain things and we are gonna do other things that we might fulfill our purpose. Ultimately, we discussed this a lot in the short life of Northwest Church already, but, but underneath everything, underneath every motivation, the, the, the foundational motivation of God and all that he does and all that we're to do is his glory. And it's to that end that he desires that people be born again. And that is the end that we as honorable vessels are to work toward. We're to be apprentices of Jesus, disciples of Jesus, who begin by just spending time with Jesus. And then over time, think of an apprentice with uh, a journeyman in a trade or in, in some sort of craft. The helper just needs to spend time with, right? And then over time, he'll become like his master, the journeyman, the professional, you know. But then, over time, the goal is that he carry on the work of the person he's training under. This is what we're called to, and, and, and a motivation for us, and, and a way for us to glorify God is to expand his kingdom with the salvation of the people that, that we come into contact with. It's awesome. So, so with all of that in mind, uh, to kind of fly over, let's now dive in and, and, and look a little bit more closely at the details here. First, the negative commands. Verse 23, Paul says, have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. Have nothing to do with them. This is an important word, I believe. As I was just thinking through this, this text this week, I was thinking, 
What could be a more important word for Americans in the 2020s? <laughs> this cultural moment that we're living in, in 2022, is filled with foolish, ignorant controversy. The word controversy, just the English word that the, the translators chose here, is a prolonged public dispute, debate, or contention concerning a matter of opinion. I like the way the NIV translates this. The NIV says, have nothing to do with stupid arguments. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> there is an abundance of stupid arguments. Foolishness, matters of opinion, prolonged public disputes, debates, contentions. This is true, obviously, politically. This is true theologically. And really, that's more of the emphasis that I see in this epistle, is don't argue about, don't have stupid arguments, foolish arguments, about things that you're ignorant about. <laughs> concerning the scriptures, concerning theology, genealogies. I've listened to so many people rip into each other over Calvinism and, Arminian, uh, and Arminianism, and they can't pronounce it, and, and, and they, can't, they can't define it. When I hear them talk about it, it's clear that they don't know what they're talking about. People get so uptight about eschatology, last things, but they don't know. <laughs> they don't know the arguments for or against what they believe in many cases. I'm not saying in every case, and I'm not saying it's bad to talk about important things, but I am saying, I'm reading this and looking around in the church and not in the church. I'm just looking around and I'm seeing so many people be unkind. I'm seeing so many people be mean. I'm seeing so many people rip into each other on Facebook. You know, like not even in person. <laughs> and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm trying to tune in to what the apostle's writing here and he's saying, hey, have nothing to do with, with fighting, with words. Look, look back in, in chapter two, in, in verse 14, he says, remind them of these things and charge them before God not to quarrel about words. It does no good. It only ruins the hearer. It only ruins the hearer. If, if we're truly discussing things, you know, it's interesting. When I was young, when I was, a, you know, probably 19, uh, 18, 19 years old, um, I was in a, in a school of ministry and a bunch of young guys, and, and young guys love to argue about Calvinism. I, and I didn't know anything about Calvinism at the time, but I decided I wasn't going to study it at all because I was so disgusted. Uh, yeah, it's, it's funny. when I later did dive into the whole world of that debate, I learned that Calvinists have this, this phrase they use specifically about young people who are passionate about Calvinism. They call it the cage stage. They say, when people first become Calvinists, they need to be locked in a cage. <laughs> <laughs> they, they need to not be engaging because for some reason, when they become passionate about Calvinism, they become aggressive and, and, and belligerent with other people concerning these things. And so it was, it was just interesting to me. I was listening to these older guys, all with white hair, saying, you know, there's the cage stage. And then after a year or a couple, 
hopefully, you know, we can let them out and they can be nice and, and engage in, in these things. Because, and, and all of these guys are Calvinists. They're like, these, these, are, these are good and right beliefs. I agree with them. It's not that they're wrong in content. It's that they're wrong in interacting with people. They're quarrelsome. They're fighting with their words. And that only does ruin to the hearer. Yes, engage in conversations about important things, 100%. But not if you're going to do it in a way that's going to ruin the hearer. This is interesting from Paul. Because Paul was one who proclaimed the truth. And anywhere he went, there was either a revival or a riot or both. It's not that we need to be afraid to talk about important things. This is what it is. We, we must be more concerned about the person that we're talking to than we are about winning an argument. If we care more about winning an argument than we do about saving someone's soul, then we're in error. We need to pump the brakes. We need to settle down. We need to take it easy. It does no good, have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant stuff. A good starting place is to, is to get to a point where you've earned an opinion. Earn an opinion. Don't speak in ignorance with authority. That's silliness, right? Don't, don't, don't speak until you've earned an opinion on it. Study like we've already studied in this epistle to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who doesn't need to be ashamed, rightly handling, rightly dividing the word of truth. We need to be mindful of delivery and also mindful of the person we're inter inter interacting with and engaging with because sometimes you can tell if somebody is wanting to actually have an, an honest and sincere conversation about important things, or if they're just wanting to pick a fight. I think wisdom says if somebody wants to pick a fight, just disengage. Have nothing to do, verse 23, with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. And, verse 24, the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome. You must not be given to waging war with words. You must not be belligerent. You must not be warlike. But then we get into the positive commands, verse 24. But we are to be kind or gentle synonyms. They, they are, it's translated different ways depending on the Bible you have in your lap. Uh, some say gentle, some say kind. Both are true and right. We're to be kind to everyone. And there's no requirement attached to that. It's not. We are to be kind to everyone with the same color skin as you and me. It's not we are to be kind to everyone who votes the same way as me or you. It's not that we are to be kind to everyone who holds your same theological views and opinions. It's we're to be kind, we're to be gentle, we're to be easy to approach and to talk to, to interact with. We're, we're to be kind to everyone. No requirement attached to that to all people. And we are to be able to teach. So we're to be kind, we're to be gentle, and we are to be able, able, able to teach. If we are in a scenario where Calvinism comes up or eschatology comes up or whatever it is comes up, 
that could in one case be something we just need to avoid. But in another case, be the most, like if someone's really wrestling through Calvinism and, and, and Arminianism and, and what about the millennium or, or what about eschatology and, and the rapture and, and all of these things, things that can produce fights. But if somebody's really just genuinely wanting to have a conversation about it, we need to be able to teach, able to answer, able to help, to instruct the idea here, if, if you study the Greek, packed into this is, is able to, to skillfully teach. To skillfully teach in a way that doesn't ruin the hearer. Maybe they wildly disagree with what you're teaching them. But, but to, to skillfully handle the word of truth and, and to present it and to deliver it in a way that doesn't shut them down, but in a way that helps to open their eyes up to see the goodness of the truth that is in Christ. My goodness, we need, we need to be able to teach as disciples of Jesus, as apprentices of him, as, as honorable vessels for an honorable use. We need to spend time with Jesus and hopefully he can help us with the help of the Holy Spirit become more like Jesus that we might be able to do what he did and lead people into truth. Again, with a view towards not the ruin of the here, verse 14, but the salvation and repentance of those who are held captive by the enemy in the kingdom of darkness. We want to help people come to the light, to Jesus and the word of truth. So, so we're to be kind, not mean, not rude, not holier than thou or are just uncool. We're, no, we're, we're to be cool to people. We're to be kind and gentle with people and able to help them see the truth. Patiently enduring evil. That's a, that's a, that's a packed couple words. Patiently enduring evil. Again, when Paul went to pick up his pen to write this, he's in a dungeon. He's about to be beheaded. Paul picks up his pen practicing this, patiently enduring evil. There's evil in this world. We want so bad as humans and as Americans to just believe that people are basically good. But when push comes to shove, we lock our doors at night. <laughs> we set passwords on our devices. We understand that we have stuff that people want to take. You know, we, we, uh, we understand that, that though we may say, oh yeah, everybody's basically good. No, they may do things from time to time that aren't the best, but you know, people are, people are good. Fundamentally, we are by nature sinners. And, and that's, that's the reality. And that's why we lock our doors, right? We're not to go and fight. Which is especially as an American, that's what's built into our, our worldview, right? Uh, to, to kick back. But Paul says patiently endure evil. It's fascinating to me. Turn a couple pages to the right, to the book of James. Oh, more than a couple pages. It's past Hebrews. Because with this, for me, the question is not what am I supposed to do, it's how. <laughs> uh, Okay, I'm not to be given to fight with my words. I'm to be kind to all people. I'm to be gentle. Uh, I, I'm to be able to teach and to do so skillfully, not to, to run them off, you know, but, but to, to bring them into the family of God. 
by the way, side note, uh, th this is this is one of those things where I'm not going to say that it's always wrong to rant on online on social media, but I think it is most of the time because um, because we have courage behind a screen and a keyboard to say things that we would never say in person. And we also, uh, we also struggle as humans to communicate well over text sometimes. And, and even if we don't mean things to be malicious, sometimes they just feel that way when, when, when they're being read. And when, when, I, when I see just everything that we all see, um, especially on social media, I find myself thinking, my goodness, this is something that someone who is captive in the kingdom of darkness will not read and say, oh, how beautiful is Jesus? <laughs> how wonderful, how good is the news? But it's something where they'll hold up their phone to their friend and say, this is why I don't want anything to do with Jesus. And so just a word of, of, of encouragement to prayerfully consider how we engage with people, not just on social media, in person too, but in the day and age we're living in, uh, we really, I think, need to be thoughtful. I'm not saying it's never fruitful. It is, I'm sure. We need to proceed with wisdom. But, but anyways, these things are easy to read in 2 Timothy and, and to say, yeah, I should, I should be like that. I should be kind to everybody. I should not be one who is fighting about stupid things and having dumb arguments. Uh, ruining the people that are listening, but able to teach and to do so skillfully, to endure evil patiently. Who's good at patience? It's like, none of us are good at patience. Uh, you know, so, so it's easy to hear these things and, and to say, yes, I agree with these things. But the New Testament really does give us instruction, examples, and, and help to be honorable vessels, to be more like Jesus, to carry on the work of Jesus. And, and so this morning, I kind of just want to give a little bit of an avalanche of just scripture and of Jesus as we consider not just what we're called to do, these negative commands, don't do this, don't be a fighter with your words, do this, positive commands, but to really just glean help from God through his word. I had you turn to James specifically because of, of uh, we're, we're talking about fights and quarrels and, and we're talking about patiently enduring evil. James chapter four, he says, what causes quarrels? Speaking of quarrels and fights, what causes them? What causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, Whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose that it is to no purpose that the scripture says, he, God, yearns jealousy over the spirit that is made to dwell in us. But, verse six, he gives more grace. Praise God for that. Because I too often fit the description of people with disordered desires and passions who get themselves into trouble going after those disordered desires. But, but, but God gives more grace. Verse six, therefore it says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Most of the time when we're arguing in a way that's not good, we lack humility. That's just something to be mindful of. God resists the proud but he gives grace to the humble. 
May the Lord help us to be humble and receive his grace. Verse seven, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Those of you who want to be honorable, honorable vessels, God desires clean vessels, so cleanse your hands and purify your hearts, you double-minded. The idea, don't be double-minded. <laughs> cleanse yourself, purify yourself. Check out verse nine. Be wretched, huh? Yeah, and mourn and weep. I thought we were supposed to be joyful and laugh and, and, and everything is awesome. Haven't you seen the Lego movie, you know? Uh, James says, in the New King James, lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. What? Yeah, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. I lost my place. Where am I at? Verse 10, thanks. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. He will lift you up. So it's not that you're gonna stay down, but you need to understand a right view of yourself and the world that you're, that you're living in, the reality that you're a part of. And the Lord will lift you up. He'll exalt you. Verse 11, talking about fighting with your words. No, no, no. Verse 11, do not speak evil against one another, brothers. <laughs> we need to hear that. We need to hear that. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. We can get so upset, <laughs> even about good things, that all of a sudden we become transgressors. He says in verse 12, there's only one lawgiver and judge. He who is able to save and destroy, but who are you to judge? A neighbor, my place isn't to fight with words or to judge or condemn. My place is to be kind to everyone, to be gentle with everyone, with a view toward not their ruin, but their salvation, their good, their benefit, their joy. Come now, verse 13. You who say today or tomorrow we should go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. You do not know what tomorrow will bring. <laughs> what is your life? That's a great question to ask. <laughs> James says, for you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. Again, we're, we're, we're trying to make the shift towards humility, right? He says, all such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it for him, it is sin. Come now, verse, or chapter five. Come now, you rich. Okay, you're, we just have established that your life's a vapor. It's here for a minute and it's gone the next minute. So those of you who are living for the minute, those of you who are investing everything you are for this present life that's gonna vanish like a, like a morning fog. Come here, James says. I have something to say to you. <laughs> he says, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. If you waste your life on this life, miseries are coming upon you for eternity. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded and the corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. By the way, in the next chapter, we're finishing chapter two today in 2 Timothy, but in, in, in chapter three, Paul's 
Everything we're discussing right now is getting ready for Paul to say, hey, perilous times are coming. In the last days, perilous times are coming. Difficult times are coming. Paul needed courage in his day and he knew that we would need courage in our day. And so he's been saying, be strong, be strong, be strong. And now he's saying, be kind. And, and, and when, when I think about where we're going in 2 Timothy, it just ties into to James here. You have laid up treasure in the last days, meaning you've laid up treasure here on earth. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud. So you've been dishonest in your dealings. Their wages are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Meaning God, God is allowing you to do what you're doing now, but you'll be accountable on that day. Stern words to the evildoer. But then James shifts his tone. And, and let's read this next section in light of, of Paul saying in our text today, patiently endure evil. These, these people were being ripped off by, by the guys who, who had the power to do so. And they're crying out to the Lord. And the Lord's letting those rich people powerful people. He's letting them know, hey, you're, you're going to be accountable. But, but the cries of those who were enduring evil reached the ear of the Lord. And so now a word to them from the Lord, be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. Perilous times are coming. Difficult times are ahead. But patiently endure evil until the coming of the Lord. Set your eyes on him. Blessed are they, the scriptures teach, who love his appearing. Who love the thought of Jesus coming for his own and bringing us to gather to himself. Be patient. Don't fight. Don't kick back. No, patiently endure evil. Patiently, patiently wait until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth. Be, uh, being patient about it until it receives the early and late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Instead of fighting, Establish your heart. What a, what a statement. Establish your heart. For the coming of the Lord is at hand. His coming is at hand. So be ready. Be ready. Do not, verse 9, grumble against one another, brothers. That's what we're so naturally going to do is to just grumble against that person on the news or that politician we're aware of or that person or church or teacher or whatever to just grumble he's saying hey don't grumble against one another not only does it ruin the hearer like we learned in second timothy 2 but he's saying hey don't grumble against other people so that you won't be judged. <laughs> Behold, the judge is standing at the door. And then he goes on to say, consider the, the prophets, consider Job as examples. That's a homework task if you want it. Read the prophets, read Job. Consider these faithful men who patiently endured. We count them blessed who endure, James says because we see the end intended by it all, that the Lord is compassionate and merciful. 
You can turn back to 2 Timothy. I wanted to just fly through that big section of scripture because God's given us his word to help us, right? But, but, but I, wanna, I wanna shift gears now and not just look to an epistle, James, but, but check out in verse, let me see here, 25, he says, correcting his opponents with gentleness or excuse me, look, look back at verse 24. It says, and the Lord's servant must not be these things and must be the other things. He says, the Lord's servant, that, that's Paul. Paul and, and many of the uh, apostles identify themselves as that. And that's what all of us are to be. We're, we're to be servants of the Lord. The Lord's servant must not be a fighter with words, but must be kind, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, all of this stuff with a view towards the, the salvation uh, of the lost. But it's on my heart to just look at the true and better Lord's servant, Jesus Christ. In, in Matthew 12, you don't need to turn there, but in Matthew 12, Jesus heals the man with the withered hand. Beautiful story. Jesus says to the man, stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out and it was restored. He had a crippled, paralyzed hand. He's restored and his hand's healthy like the other. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against Jesus how to destroy him. So Jesus does good. Jesus brings healing. And these guys go out and they conspire on how they're gonna destroy him. Jesus, aware of this, he withdrew from there, it says, and many followed him. And he healed them all. And he ordered them not to make him known. And this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. We're talking about reading the prophets and considering them. Check out what Isaiah said. Behold my servant, Speaking of Jesus, the Lord says, Behold my servant Jesus, whom I have chosen, my beloved, with whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he, Jesus, will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel or cry aloud nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench until he brings justice to victory. I love that. And in his name, the Gentiles will hope. I love that. He is the Lord's servant. He, Jesus the Christ, is the honorable vessel who is kind to everyone, who is able to teach skillfully, who in his life here on earth, in a very, very real way, patiently endured evil. If I want to be the Lord's servant like him, and, and not do this stuff and, and engage positively in that stuff. I wanna learn from Jesus. You can turn to Matthew 22. In Matthew 22, we just see the master do his thing. We see Jesus. When people are coming at him aggressively to find fault with him, to trap him, to to, to get him in hot water with the Jews or with the Romans or with anybody. They're just, they're coming at him with words, with disputes publicly. How do I navigate the 2020s and Facebook and, and, and life? How, how do I do the word and not just be a hearer of the word? Let's learn from the Lord's servant. Verse 15. Then the Pharisees went and plotted 
how to entangle Jesus in his words. And they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully. And you do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, verse 18, I love this, aware of their malice, he was able to read the situation. They were plotting against him, it said, how to entangle him with his words. They were malintended. And verse 18 says Jesus was aware of their malice. They're trying to to entangle him because Israel has a long history of being oppressed by people. And in this day and age that Jesus was was happening uh, happening to be a part of uh, in his life on earth, the Romans were oppressing Israel. And and Israel was not okay with it. There was a lot of tension there. Caesar claimed to be Lord. And many of the Jews refused to pay taxes to Caesar because they did not want to acknowledge him as Lord. And so if Jesus says, pay your taxes, these guys, according to their scheme, are thinking he's going to get himself in trouble with the, with the Jewish community. But if he says, don't pay your taxes, then he's going to get himself in trouble with Rome. Right? He, he, he will be charged with political rebellion as a Jewish rabbi teaching people not to pay their taxes, tax evasion, all of this kind of stuff. So, so they're, they're trying to, to set him up here. But Jesus says, verse 18, why put me to the test, you hypocrites? This isn't malicious, this is honest. Why, why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. He said to them, therefore render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And when they heard it, they marveled and they left him and went away. He, he gets underneath the foolish dispute. And he gets a, 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 at the heart of a much greater issue. You're made in the image of God. Why are you so concerned with a political argument? Render to Caesar, it's got his picture on it, give it to him. You are made in the image of God. It foreshadows what Paul later says, present yourself a living sacrifice to him. They marveled at this. The Jews couldn't get upset. And well, the Romans had their money. Verse 23, the same day the Sadducees came to him, the Sadducees, uh, they didn't believe in the resurrection. And so they asked him this question. They said in verse 24, teacher, Moses said, if a man dies having no children, uh, his brother, according to the Levitical law, must marry the widow and raise up offspring for her brother. Verse 25, now there were seven brothers among us. They go on to tell the story of how each brother dies and then they all marry the the woman, right? Verse 28, in the resurrection, they ask, of the seven, whose wife will she be? For they all had her. Jesus here, he's able to teach. He's able to teach. Verse 29, Jesus answered them, you are wrong. (laughs) You are wrong because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they will neither marry nor, be, uh, nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? I am, ego eimi, Exodus 3, I am, present tense, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Not I was the God of these guys. I am their living still, the implication being. He is not the God 
of the dead, but of the living. And when the crowd heard it, they were astonished at his teaching. He, he's, he's able to teach these malintended people who are coming at him with words. And, and, and say, no, relationships are going to work different in heaven. Here's a fundamental truth about God and the way he saves his people. He's able to skillfully teach and leave the people just like, wow. They're astonished at what he's presenting to them. And when we read him calling them hypocrites or saying, you're wrong, don't picture him with a scowl of condemnation. I don't know, perhaps some of you guys have seen uh, the movie called The Gospel of Matthew. Bruce Marciano portrays Jesus in it. And he's just an actor, and so we don't really know, you know. But I, I think that he, especially compared to some of the other films that you see, you know, about Jesus, he did a good job. And one thing that stood out to me was one scene where he's rebuking the Pharisees and the religious community and he's saying really harsh stuff, especially, again, sometimes it's hard to tell over text, right? right? I've prayed so many times as I'm reading the scriptures, Lord, help me to, to, to see in your word with the help of the Holy Spirit. Help me to see your disposition as you're dealing with people. Because I can say the exact same thing one way and another way, and one way is fruitful and one way is sin. So Lord, help me. How did you do it? How did you come full of grace and truth? Well, in, in the Gospel of Matthew, there was this one particular scene that just stood out to me because I'm not a very, I've never been very touchy-feely or huggy, kissy kind of a person, you know, but I've been shocked as I've had kids the way I smother them. Um, I just hug them and kiss them and it's just, that's not like me, but it is with my kids. And there's this scene where Jesus is calling these Pharisees, he's like, you brood of vipers. Like not good words, like hypocrites. But while he's talking to these guys who are just looking at him with just, they, with hatred, Jesus just walks up to this Pharisee while he's saying all this stuff and he just grabs his head and he gives him a kiss on the forehead. Like I would give a kiss on the forehead to my son. And I just saw that and it stood out to me and I thought, wow. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. He was in the beginning with God and all things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus wasn't just a dude. He was also a dude that was truly and fully God and he is creator of the very ones he's calling out as hypocrites and vipers. I love you, Pharisee. Kiss on the forehead. And he's able to teach them. And our, our generation is so concerned with being nice that we refuse to present truth lest they reject us or be offended by us. Jesus was willing that people may reject him or misunderstand him or whatever. He was willing to take that risk or to make that move, knowing that that would happen with many because he loved them enough to tell the truth. Kindness is a big buzzword. Love is a big buzzword in our culture, in these days we're living in. Be kind has become a slogan. Love wins has become a slogan. Good things, but, but it's almost as if people want the kingdom, but they, they want to reject the king. And, and they twist it to try and make it work in a way that seems great, but, but has no weight. And so the bottom falls out from underneath it because cultural kindness is different than Christ-like kindness. There's two things that look very much similar at a glance, but are very different because because. Christ-like kindness is rooted in love. He's kind to everyone. He's willing to offend that he might save, right? He loves them. He's willing to lay down his life for them. But 
cultural kindness doesn't actually care about the person. Cultural kindness is like, just tolerate, right? Tolerance. Tolerate the differences. But here's the thing. If, if you put on a, faca- uh, you know, a facade of, of, of kindness, a front, a fake, a mask of niceness, but you don't actually love and you don't actually care, a couple things are going to happen fast. One is, is, is everything about it is insincere, and so that'll become evident to everybody, right? And, and so at best, you have people putting on a fake front of niceness that people can see through, and at and at worst, if, if that's a best case scenario, it's just like enduring begrudgingly in a way that gives everybody distaste in their mouth. At best, at worst, it, 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 it's a look of niceness with a heart of just hatred behind it. And if, and if that's happening, if that's festering underneath the surface, it will come out the way we're seeing it play out in the world around us. People are saying, be nice, be kind, be tolerant. But with every day and week and month and year that's passing, we're just watching the quote, United States become increasingly divided and malicious. It's radical. Don't, don't play the game. We're, we're after a Christ-like love. I like the Hebrew word for, for kindness. It's loving kindness, right? It's, it's, it's not mere niceness. It's, it's loving and truly caring in a way that, that is willing to sacrifice one's own good for the sake of others. Jesus just teaches us how to do this by example. Verse 34, but when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, uh uh-oh, a lawyer asks him a question to test him. Teacher, verse 36, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. This is the the great and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So Jesus steers this toward love. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Now, verse 41, I love this part. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question. So they're coming at him. They're trying to to get him in hot water. He quells the fire they're trying to start around him. And then he asks them a question. What do you think about the Christ? What do you think about the Christ? He brings the conversation to the Christ. That's an example for me and for us. Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. The son of David. Easy answer. He said to them, verse 43, he, I like this. He, it's kind of like he baits them in and then he gives them the, the, the right hook, you know? Uh, he, he, he baits them in. The son of David. I'm glad you answered like that. I could, I could see him thinking. How is it then, verse 43, that David in the spirit calls the Christ Lord? Saying, quoting Psalm 10, uh, 110, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him, verse 46. No one was able to answer him a word, and nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. 
the servant of the Lord, our, our savior, our leader, our friend, our king, Jesus, he shows us how to do this. We must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. We, we must learn not to see people as the problem or as the enemy. We must learn to see people as fellow image bearers of God who are captured by the enemy to do his will. We look at people and we think, how could they think that? How can they believe the other? How could someone do what Hitler did? The scriptures say they've been captured by the devil. They've been captured in the kingdom of darkness, captured by Satan to do his will. That's wild. The Lord desires that we join in what he's doing and lead captivity captive to go and capture them out of the enemy camp and bring them home with kindness and gentleness, with teaching, with patience, with Christ-like kindness and love. How do we do this? Again, look to Jesus. Remember, Jesus was kind to all kinds of people. There are all kinds of people in your life, and, and we're coming to a close here. But, but remember when, when the leper cries out to, to Jesus, and he just wants to be healed. But he was a guy who, because of his leprosy, was outcast by his entire community. Uh, anytime anybody... Uh, would, would come within, you know, a stone's throw. You'd have to cry, unclean, unclean. And everybody would put their mask on and, you know. But he cries out to the son of David. And Jesus touches the untouchable. He could have holler from a distance and made him clean. But he goes and with kindness touches him. He gets his hands dirty. He gets close enough to smell the guy's smell. And he heals him. He touches the untouchable. Not only that, he does the unthinkable, speaking to the Samaritan woman. A Jewish rabbi would not speak to a Samaritan or a woman, much less a Samaritan woman. But Jesus extends kindness to her, breaking down all kinds of barriers in doing so. And, and, and he's patient with her. He's kind and gentle with her. He teaches her, John 4, all of this stuff about worship and what the Father's seeking. And he takes this one who no one would have anything to do with. And he makes her a useful, honorable vessel, effective in bringing many to him in that very story. He touches the untouchable. He does the unthinkable. He goes, and not only does he reach down, he reaches up. Not that Jesus truly could reach up to anybody, but... but, but a Pharisee, Nicodemus, who wants to meet him at night. I don't know for sure. Many have suggested that Nicodemus wanted to meet with Jesus at night because he didn't want to be seen with Jesus. It wasn't that, that Jesus would be inclined to say, I, I can't be seen with a woman, a Samaritan woman in public. A Pharisee's likely thinking, I, I don't want to be associated with him. 
but Jesus is willing to meet with him under the cloak of night, you know. And he gives him John 3.16. He, he, he imparts to him gold. Religious elite. All kinds of people. A Roman centurion. Jesus heals his servant. A Jewish traitor who's siding with Rome. Matthew, the tax collector, despised by patriots of Israel. Jesus calls him and makes him a disciple. And Jesus is a peacemaker between him and someone that uh, would kill him if given the opportunity earlier. Simon the Zealot, a dagger bearer. These guys would put knives in their robes so that they could stab people like Matthew because they were tax collectors siding with Rome. Jesus calls them and they both serve alongside of each other. Jesus makes peace among people who would normally just be fighting over all kinds of stuff. Not just people who would ultimately follow him, but people who would betray him. Jesus calls Judas friend when he's betraying him. When, when, when they come to arrest him, when the mob comes and to arrest Jesus and, and Peter lops off the servant's ear, Jesus extends kindness and heals the guy's ear. He puts it back on his head. You name the story. You name the category of, of person that Jesus is willing to extend himself to. Ultimately, Titus, in the book of Titus, I need to check my notes. I won't for the sake of time. But us, God extends his kindness towards us and saves us. We who were at, enemy, at enmity excuse me, with him, God in his loving kindness saves us and brings us into the family. And so as we go our way in just a minute, just consider how might the Lord lead you in being a doer of the word? I'd say this week, but just in life moving forward. Who are the people that are lost, that are held captive by the enemy, that the Lord's put you in their sphere. May the Holy Spirit use us to be Christ-like and, and useful with a view toward the saving of people who just need Jesus. It's my prayer that God would use me, and it's, it's my prayer that God would use this church to be a place where people can come and be loved and be cared for and be taught and be saved. In Jesus' name, amen.